Welcome to Sleep Time and Bible. It's the time to release your stress, worry, and other cares for the day and simply relax. Fall asleep to a dramatized reading of the Bible, including music, nature sounds, and sound effects. I'm your host, Dr. Tamika Hall, and I'm excited to preview the first book of our show. Journey with me to the world of ancient Persia around the time of 483 BC as we read the book of Esther. The book of Esther invites the reader into the world of the powerful and wealthy Persian royal court under the rule of 5th century Persian king Ahasuerus, also called King Xerxes in some versions of the Bible. For some background, the Persians came into power under Cyrus, a Persian leader who allowed Jews exiled in Babylon to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild the city and its temple. Persia was an Asian country in the southwest region, and the Persian Empire was a group of empires located in what is currently known as Afghanistan and Iran. In the Book of Esther, we encounter a rich and powerful Persian court, and we will read all about palace intrigue, power and foreign law, and of course, courage and faith. Now, Esther is the only book that does not directly use the name of God, but it is one that teaches the readers to discern the presence of God in a time and place where God seemed to be quite absent. I can't wait for you to journey with me. In the meantime, don't forget to subscribe and I will see you between the pages of Sleep Time and Bible. Welcome to Sleep Time and Bible. It's the time to release your stress, your worry, and other cares of the day, and simply relax. I'm your host, Dr. Tamika Hall, and I'm excited to lead you through the Bible and into a space of peaceful rest. Take a moment to close your eyes Allow your body to sink into the bed. First, start at your feet. That's it. Relax them. Let it travel through your legs. Let your back sink into the mattress. Release the tension in your neck. Let it sink into the pillow. And finally, Let your head just rest. Take a deep breath in through your nose. One, two, three, four, and let it out through your mouth. One, two, three, four. Let the sound of the rain, let the fire crackling in the fireplace, take you to a pace of rest. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, and tonight we will step into the first three chapters of the Book of Esther, a world of ancient Persia, into the court where we meet King Xerxes, Queen Vashti, and several of the king's advisors during a time of feasting and These events happened in the days of King Xerxes, who reigned over 127 provinces stretching from India to Ethiopia. At that time, Xerxes ruled his empire from his royal throne at the fortress of Susa. In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. He invited all the military officers of Persia and Media as well as the princes and nobles of the provinces. The celebration lasted 180 days, a tremendous display of the opulent wealth of his empire and the pomp and splendor of his majesty. When it was all over, 
the king gave a banquet for all the people, from the greatest to the least, who were in the fortress of Susa. It lasted for seven days and was held in the courtyard of the palace garden. The courtyard was beautifully decorated with white cotton curtains and blue hangings, which were fastened with white linen cords and purple ribbons to silver rings embedded in marble pillars. Gold and silver couches stood on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Drinks were served in gold goblets of many designs, and there was an abundance of royal wine reflecting the king's generosity. By edict of the king, no limits were placed on the drinking, for the king had instructed all his palace officials to serve each man as much as he wanted. At the same time, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. And on the seventh day of the feast, when King Xerxes was in high spirits because of the wine, he told the seven eunuchs who attended him, Mehuman, Bizda, Harbona, Bigtha, Abigtha, Zithar, and Carcass, to bring Queen Vashti to him with the royal crown on her head. He wanted the nobles and all the other men to gaze on her beauty, for she was a very beautiful woman. But when they conveyed the king's orders to Queen Vashti, she refused to come. This made the king furious, and he burned with anger. He immediately consulted with his wise advisors, who knew all the Persian laws and customs, for he always asked their advice. The names of these men were Karshena, Shathar, Admatha, Tarshish, Miris, and Marcina, and Mimukin seven nobles of Persia and Media. They met with the king regularly and held the highest positions in the empire. What must be done to Queen Vashti? The king demanded. What penalty does the law provide for a queen who refuses to obey the king's orders properly sent through his eunuchs? Mimukin answered the king and his nobles. Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but also every noble and citizen throughout your empire. Women everywhere will begin to despise their husbands when they learn that Queen Vashti has refused to appear before the king. Before this day is out, the wives of all the king's nobles throughout Persia and Media will hear what the queen did and will start treating their husbands the same way. There will be no end to their contempt and anger. So, if it please the king, we suggest that you issue a written decree, a law of the Persians and Medes that cannot be revoked. It should order that Queen Vashti be forever banished from the presence of King Xerxes, and that the king should choose another queen more worthy than she. And when this decree is published throughout the king's vast empire, husbands everywhere, whatever their rank, will receive proper respect from their wives. The king and his nobles thought this made good sense, so he followed Mimukin's counsel. He sent letters to all parts of the empire, to each province in its own script and language, proclaiming, that every man should be the ruler of his own home and should say whatever he pleases. Chapter two. But after Xerxes' anger had subsided, he began thinking about Vashti and what she had done and the decree that he had made. So his personal attendants suggested let us search the empire to find beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint agents in every province to bring these beautiful young women into the royal harem at the fortress of Susa. Haggai, the king's eunuch in charge of the harem, will see that they are given beauty treatments, 
And then after that, the young woman who most pleases the king will be made queen instead of Vashti. Well, this advice was very appealing to the king, so he put the plan into effect. At that time, there was a Jewish man in the fortress of Susha, whose name was Mordecai, son of Jer. He was from the tribe of Benjamin and was a descendant of Kish and Shammai. His family had been among those who, with King Jehoiachin of Judah, had been exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. This man had a very beautiful and lovely young cousin, Hadassah, who was also called Esther. When her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her into his family and raised her as his own daughter. As a result of the king's decree, Esther, along with many other young women, were brought to the king's harem at the fortress of Susa and placed in Haggai's care. Haggai was very impressed with Esther and treated her kindly. He quickly ordered a special menu for her, provided her with beauty treatments, and he also assigned her seven maids specially chosen from the king's palace. He moved her and her maids into the best place in the harem. Esther had not told anyone of her nationality and family background because Mordecai had directed her not to do so. Every day, Mordecai would take a walk near the courtyard of the harem to find out about Esther and what was happening to her. Before each young woman was taken to the king's bed, she was given the prescribed 12 months of beauty treatments, six months with oil of myrrh, followed by six months with special perfumes and ointments. When it was time for her to go to the king's palace, she was given her choice of whatever clothing or jewelry she wanted to take from the harem. That evening, she was taken to the king's private rooms, and the next morning, she was brought to the second harem where the king's wives lived. There, she was under the care of Shagaz, the king's eunuch in charge of the concubines. She would never go to the king again unless he had especially enjoyed her and requested her by name. Esther was the daughter of Abihail, who was Mordecai's uncle. Mordecai had adopted his younger cousin, Esther. And when it was Esther's turn to go to the king, she accepted the advice of Haggai, the eunuch in charge of the harem. She asked for nothing except what he suggested, and she was admired by everyone who saw her. Esther was taken to King Xerxes at the royal palace in early winter of the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther more than any other young woman. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Vashti. To celebrate the occasion, he gave a great banquet in Esther's honor for all his nobles and officials, declaring a public holiday for the provinces and giving generous gifts to everyone. Even after the young women had been transferred to the second harem, and Mordecai had become a palace official, Esther continued to keep her family background and nationality a secret. She was still following Mordecai's directions, just as she did when she lived in his home. One day as Mordecai was on duty at the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigthana and Teresh, who were guards at the door of the king's private quarters, became angry at King Xerxes and plotted to assassinate him. But Mordecai heard about the plot and gave the information to Queen Esther. She then told the king about it and gave Mordecai credit for the report. When an investigation was made and Mordecai's story was found to be true, the two men were impaled on a sharpened pole. This was all recorded in the book of the history of King Xerxes' reign. Chapter 3 Sometime later, King Xerxes promoted Haman 
son of Hamadatha, the Agite over all the other nobles, making him the most powerful official in the empire. All the king's officials would bow down before Haman to show him respect whenever he passed by, for so the king had commanded. But Mordecai refused to bow down or show him respect. Then the palace officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, why are you disobeying the king's command? They spoke to him day after day, but still he refused to comply with the order. So they spoke to Haman about this to see if he would tolerate Mordecai's conduct, since Mordecai had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow down or show him respect, he was filled with rage. He had learned of Mordecai's nationality, so he decided it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the entire empire of Xerxes. So in the month of April, during the 12th year of King Xerxes' reign, lots were cast in Haman's presence. The lots were called Purim, and they were used to determine the best day and month to take action. And the day selected was March 7th, nearly a year later. Then Haman approached King Xerxes and said, there is a certain race of people scattered throughout all the provinces of your empire who keep themselves separate from everyone else. Their laws are different from those of any other people and they refuse to obey the laws of the king. So it is not in the king's interest to let them live. If it please the king, issue a decree that they be destroyed and I will give 10,000 large sacks of silver to the government administrators to be deposited into the royal treasury. The king agreed. To confirm his decision, he removed his signet ring from his finger, gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agite, the enemy of the Jews. The king said, The money and the people are both yours to do with as you see fit. So on April 17th, the king's secretaries were summoned and a decree was written exactly as Haman dictated. It was sent to the king's highest officials. It was sent to the king's highest officers, the governors of the respective provinces and the nobles of each province in their own scripts and language. The decree was written in the name of King Xerxes and sealed with the king's signet ring. Dispatches were sent by swift messengers into all the provinces of the empire, giving the order that all Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed, slaughtered, and annihilated on a single day. This was scheduled to happen on March 7th of the next year. The property of the Jews would be given to those who killed them. A copy of this decree was to be issued as law in every province and proclaim to all people so that they would be ready to do their duty on the appointed day. And at the king's command, the decree went out by swift messengers and it was also proclaimed in the fortress of Susa. Then the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa fell into confusion. When Mordecai learned about all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on burlap and ashes, and went out into the city crying with a loud and bitter wail. He went as far as the gate of the palace, for no one was allowed to enter the palace gate while wearing clothes of mourning. And as news of the king's decree reached all the provinces, there was great mourning among the Jews. They fasted, wept, and wailed 
and many people lay in burlap and ashes. When Queen Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was deeply distressed. She sent clothing to him to replace the burlap, but he refused it. Then Esther sent for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed as her attendant. She ordered him to go to Mordecai and find out what was troubling him and why he was in mourning. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the square in front of the palace gate. Mordecai told him the whole story, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai gave Hathak a copy of the decree issued in Susa that called for the death of all Jews. He asked Hathak to show it to Esther and explain the situation to her. He also asked Hathak to direct her to go to the king to beg for mercy and plead for her people. So Hathak returned to Esther with Mordecai's message. Then Esther told Hathak to go back and relay this message to Mordecai. All the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his golden scepter. And the king has not called for me to come to him for 30 days. So Hathak gave Esther's message to Mordecai. Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. So Mordecai went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Chapter five. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, what is it Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom it will be given to you. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, Now what is your petition? It will be given to you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Esther replied, My petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. Calling together his friends and Jerish, his wife, Haman boasted to them about this vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him and how he had elevated him above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. 
I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave, and she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. His wife Jerish and his friends said to him, have a pole set up reaching to a height of 50 cubits and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. This suggestion delighted Haman and he had the pole set up. Chapter six, that night the king could not sleep. So he ordered the books of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officials who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. What honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked. Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. The king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about impaling Mordecai on the pole he had set up for him. His attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honor than me? So he answered the king, For the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the king and horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gates. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told Jerish his wife and all his friends everything that had happened to him. His advisors and his wife Jerish said to him, since Mordecai before whom your downfall has started is of Jewish origin. You cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet Esther had prepared. Chapter seven. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. And as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked Esther, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing. Esther said, an adversary, an enemy, this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. 
But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the words left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king said, A pole reaching to a height of 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. He had it set up for Mordecai who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. Chapter 8 That same day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. The king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and presented it to Mordecai and Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. Esther again pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. She begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman the Agite, which he had devised against the Jews. Then the king extended the gold scepter to Esther, and she arose and stood before him. If it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards me with favor, and thinks it the right thing to do. And if he is pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? King Xerxes replied to Queen Esther, and to Mordecai the Jew. Because Haman attacked the Jews, I have given his estate to Esther, and they have impaled him on the pole he set up. Now write another decree in the king's name on behalf of the Jews as seems best to you, and seal it with the king's signet ring, for no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. At once, the royal secretaries were summoned on the 23rd day of the third month, the month of Savan. They wrote out all Mordecai's orders to the Jews and to the satraps, governors, and nobles of the 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. These orders were written in the script of each province and the language of each people and also to the Jews in their own script and language. Mordecai wrote in the name of King Xerxes, sealed the dispatches with the king's signet ring, and sent them by mounted couriers who rode fast horses, especially bred for the king. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate the armed men of any nationality or province who might attack them and their women and children and to plunder the property of their enemies. The day appointed for the Jews to do this in all the provinces of King Xerxes was the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as a law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers, riding the royal horses, went out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. When Mordecai left the king's presence, he was wearing royal garments of blue and white, a large crown of gold, and a purple robe of fine linen. And the city of Susa held a joyous celebration. For the Jews, it was a time of happiness and joy, gladness and honor. In every province and in every city to which the edict of the king came, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebrating. And many people of other nationalities became Jews because fear of the Jews had seized them. On the 13th day 
of the twelfth month, the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but now the tables were turned and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities in all the provinces of King Xerxes to attack those determined to destroy them. No one could stand against them because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them and all the nobles of the provinces, the Sarechaps, the governors, and the king's administrators helped the Jews because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread through the provinces and he became more and more powerful. The Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. In the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. They also killed Parshandatha, Dalphon, Aspatha, Paratha, Adalia, Aradatha, Parmashta, Arasai, Aradai, and Vizatha, the ten sons of Haman, son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. But they did not lay their hands on the plunder. The number of those killed in the citadel of Susa was reported to the king that same day. The king said to Queen Esther, The Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and 10 sons of Haman in the citadel of Susa. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? It will also be granted. If it pleases the king, Esther answered, Give the Jews in Susa permission to carry out this day's edict tomorrow also, and let Haman's ten sons be impaled on poles. So the king commanded that this be done. An edict issued in Susa, and they impaled the ten sons of Haman. The Jews in Susa came together on the fourteenth day of the month of Adar, and they put to death in Susa three hundred men, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. This happened on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. The Jews in Susa, however, had assembled on the 13th and 14th, and then on the 15th, they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. That is why rural Jews, those living in villages, observe the 14th of the month of Adar as a day of joy and feasting, a day for giving presents to each other. Mordecai recorded these events and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes near and far to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar. As the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they had begun, doing what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the purr, that is, the lot, for their ruin and destruction. But when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued written orders that the evil scheme Haman had devised against the Jews should come back onto his own head, and that he and his sons should be impaled on the poles. Therefore, these days were called Purim, from the word Pur. Because of everything written in this letter, and because of what they had seen, and what had happened to them, the Jews took it on themselves to establish the custom 
that they and their descendants, all who would join them, should without fail observe these two days every year in the way prescribed and at the time appointed. These days should be remembered and observed in every generation, by every family, and in every province, and in every city. And these days of Purim should never fail to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of these days die out among their descendants. So Queen Esther, daughter of Abihail, along with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter concerning Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews in the 127 provinces of Xerxes' kingdom, words of goodwill and assurance, to establish these days of Purim at their designated times, as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had decreed for them, and as they had established for themselves and their descendants in regard to their times of fasting and lamentation. Esther's decree confirmed these regulations about Purim, and it was written down in the records. Chapter 10 King Xerxes imposed tribute throughout the empire to its distant shores, and all his acts of power and might, together with a full account of the greatness of Mordecai, whom the king had promoted. Are they not written in the book of Anos of the king of Media and Persia? Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, permanent among the Jews, and held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews, because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of all the Jews. This has been a reading of Esther. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that you've been able to rest and release all of your worries. And I want you to keep in mind that God is fighting for you. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what odds are stacked against you. In a moment's notice, the tables will turn and everything that the enemy meant for bad is going to work out for your good. I'm Dr. Tanika Hall. And this has been another episode of Sleep Time and Bye.